and share. I need to share my slides or you're going to. Yeah, and I can always do it, but yeah, I gave you the capability to do so as well. All right, everybody. I'm Jeremy Hirschler. I'm an addiction psychiatrist uh, here at WVU. I'm the program director of the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship. And I'm talking about today advancing quality of life in patients with substance use disorders. And uh, I've been thinking about quality of life since my residency training at the University of Maryland in Baltimore back in 1993 or so. Uh, when Tony Lehman, who was the chairman of the department, was looking at quality of life in patients with severe mental illness and created a uh, an interview to assess quality of life. And then more recently, I've been working in the pain clinic here at WVU, and outcomes are measured largely by quality of life in the work that we do uh, in chronic pain. And I think that we need to think in addictions work more about just not days of abstinence as an outcome measure, but maybe looking at other things like quality of life to determine, you know, how well patients are doing. So let's see what we've got here. So no financial disclosures. Uh, Roger Weiss, who is the program director of the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship at Harvard University, uh, the McLean Hospital and Mass General Hospital, says that when patients and addictions work get better, they get more better than almost anyone you've worked with. And so I think the potential for advancing quality of life in patients with substance use disorders is really huge. Oops, my computer is thinking. Did you want me to share, Jared? No, I got, I got it. It's just a... a <laughs> The, the little circle was going. Oh, All right. no. It's Bruce not advancing Alexander on, in, in it's, 19, not, it's not I'm advancing sorry. on our side. Is it advancing in your guys' side, the slides, or is it on the top? It's on the title. Okay. It's not advancing for them? No. You want to advance them? What slide are you on? That's fine. Yeah, I can do it. Absolutely. Give me one second. I'll get that. Sometimes it likes to be finicky. Can everyone see that? It's not in presenter mode, but we can see it. Is it not still? Oh my gosh. Is it better now? Okay, cool. <laughs> That's good. All right, so I already covered that. And we covered Roger Weiss's quote. All right, so next slide, please. All right, so in 1978, Bruce Alexander was looking at rats and how, how rats self-administered morphine water under different circumstances. And traditionally, when they look at rats, they have them locked in cages in isolation, like this picture on the left. And Bruce Alexander got the idea to create what he called a rat park, uh, where rats could play with each other. There was a wheel to run on. There were cans to hide in. And, uh, and they compared the, the self-administration of morphine water in rats in the rat park versus rats uh, who were locked in cages in isolation. And what they found is that the rats who were in isolation would self-administer morphine water until they died. And they wouldn't eat or drink or anything else. They would just take the morphine water. Whereas the rats in the rat park would just maybe intermittently, occasionally use the morphine water, but primarily just drank water and ate food and enjoyed the rat park. And so the conclusion of this, you know, kind of the understanding of this research was that social isolation is a key factor in addictions. Next slide, please. Now there was a scientist who was studying bullfrogs and uh, he taught these bullfrogs to jump on command. So he would say jump and the bullfrogs would jump. 
And uh, so he got this idea that he was going to measure how far the bullfrogs jumped. And so he took 10 frogs and told them to jump, and they jumped on command. And on average, they jumped about five feet. And so uh, he decided, OK, I'm going to cut off a leg. So he cut off one leg, and he told the bullfrogs to jump. And on average, they jumped three feet. And then he cut off two legs. And uh, the frogs with two legs, he'd tell them to jump, and they jumped. And on average, they jumped about one foot. And then he cut off a third leg and uh, told them to jump. And the frogs only jumped about eight inches. And so finally, he cut off the fourth leg. And he told these frogs to jump, and they wouldn't go anywhere. And so the conclusion of this research that the scientists made was that frogs without legs are deaf. And so I just wanted you to think about interpreting research, and maybe sometimes we draw the wrong conclusions. Next slide, please. So these are the objectives of my talk. I'm going to define the problem of quality of life in patients with substance use disorders. I'm going to talk about what are the dimensions of overall quality of life and health-related quality of life. And then I'm going to talk about four primary areas of interest, or what I call core quality of life. And then we're going to talk about the quality of time. We're going to develop a strategic plan to address quality of life and how to tailor treatment to the needs of the patient. And we're going to talk about theory and practice. There'll be a couple of case examples, and then we'll have some conclusions. Next slide. All right, so quality of life is recognized as central to the broad construct of recovery and addictions. But no, there's very few longitudinal studies that have evaluated quality of life. And so I, we seem to be neglecting what really patients care about the most in our, in our work with patients. Next slide. And so in general, in healthcare, it was thought it's logical to measure outcomes uh, that would be begin to assess not only the patient, the population's health, not only on the basis of saving lives, but also improving the quality of life. And so we become so focused on preventing deaths that we've kind of lost track of quality of life for patients. Okay, next slide. All right, so how do you measure quality of life? Well, in the most general sense, you can simply ask overall, how satisfied are you with your life? And you can use the A plus to F scale that we use in school. So just thinking, you know, how satisfied are you with your life on the A plus to F scale? All right, so just to think about that. Next slide. So Tony Robbins, who's a famous uh, life coach, he says the quality of your life is where you live emotionally. And so I wonder, you know, if this is really what's happening with patients who are trying to palliate their emotions with substances, if the quality of life is what uh, what's really needs to be addressed. Next slide. So also quality of life illuminates the burden of disease. And so for conditions that can't be cured, like addictions, quality of life becomes an important goal in treating these conditions. And if you look at substance use disorders, you get impairments in mental functioning, social roles, work, and leisure. And it's interesting because quality of life improves with abstinence and deteriorates with relapse. Next slide. So one important question that's not really been answered is, does quality of life satisfaction predict remission from substance use and a commitment to abstinence? And so my answer to that is on the next slide. My answer is that when people like their lives, they take better care of themselves. And so if people are flourishing and happy with their lives and they have good satisfaction with the quality of their life, I think they're going to want to do more for themselves to, to maintain that quality of life. And so they take better care of themselves. And that's kind of my premise for why this is important in the work we're doing. Next slide. All right, so how do you measure overall quality of life? Well, there's lots of instruments to measure quality of life and they boil down to these 10 domains of functioning. And so your satisfaction in these 10 domains is going to determine your general life review and, and the patient's quality of life. And so those domains are physical health, mental health, uh, recreation and leisure, marriage, family, social life, environment, housing and transportation, education, work and finances, uh, legal issues, their appearance, and spiritual life. And so if you can measure the satisfaction in those 10 domains, 
that's going to give you a good sense of their general life review and their overall quality of life. And then next slide. And then the CDC has been interested in health-related quality of life, which is really about mental health and physical health and the ramifications of that, you know, their perceived health status and their activity limitations. And so next slide. So this is how the CDC measures health-related quality of life. They have something called the healthy days measures. And so they ask, you know, would you say that in general, your health is excellent, good, fair, poor? Uh, and then thinking about your physical health, how many, uh, including physical illness and injury, how many days or in the past 30 days was your physical health not good? And then they ask the same kind of thing about mental health in the past 30 days, uh, including stress, depression, and problems with emotions. How many days was your mental health not good? And then they also ask in the past 30 days, how many days did physical and mental health issues keep you from doing your usual activities, such as self-care, work, or recreation? And so they've looked at these healthy days measures and compared states across the country. And so here's the, the next slide. I'll show you what the country looks like. So the dark uh, red is the most unhealthy days. And so West Virginia, Kentucky, and Alabama have the most unhealthy days of the country. And so it kind of puts in perspective what's happening uh, in West Virginia relative to the rest of the United States. And I don't have a map of the overdose death rates, but you can think, you know, how much is health-related quality of life related to uh, things like drug overdose and kind of the outcomes with addictions. Next slide. All right, so what are the patient's priorities for improvement? And so if you look at New Year's resolutions, when people make New Year's resolutions, they make them about basically four categories of issues, love, work, health, and place. And so if you look at these uh, New Year's resolutions from 2020, that's the, the common things about finances, eating healthier, lose weight, be more active, improve mental well-being. But these are all kind of things related to love, work, health, and place. And so that's what matters most to patients. And so next slide, please. And so I call this core quality of life. So it's not just health-related quality of life. It's the quality of life that matters to people that they want to improve. And so hopefully patients can try to become pretty solid at the core. You know, if you're solid at the core in quality of life, that's a good foundation for a good quality of life. And so we're differentiating from health-related quality of life or that overall quality of life with 10 domains that's so... You know, such an overwhelming kind of task to try to accomplish success in all those areas. Next slide. And then if you look at the most wealthy people in the world, what they care about quality of life wise is their quality of time. You know, how, how well is time spent? And so uh, I think that matters to patients with substance use disorders more than we might think. And, you know, if someone is using a substance, are they trying to address their quality of time? Next slide. So how can we satisfy quality of time needs? And so really, this is something that's precious to all and doesn't discriminate. You know, how well is your time spent? And so you can broaden and build a beautiful quality of time. And these are the good times that people have. And so you think, you know, that might be what's going on with people using substances is try to address their quality of time. But it's the quality of exposure as well as the, the consequence that's important in quality of time. And so you know, in the addictions field, we, of course, know about the terrible impact of substance use and consequences of substance use. And so it becomes a malproductive kind of way of trying to enhance your quality of time. But you want to get as much beautiful time out of life as you possibly can. And so not just to simply be called a success, but to have good quality of life because your quality of time is good. And so you can have extraordinary experiences and dive into your desires and things like ceremonies or meditative experiences. You know, even mowing the lawn can be good quality of time if you get into a meditative state and enjoy the activity kind of in, in a meditation and then if you think of athletes, you know, they get into that zone or flow. And so you can live life that way. You know, when I practice psychiatry, I get into a flow. It's a natural kind of process for me to flow along and, and function kind of at my best. And so 
that's good quality of time. And then a beautiful, satisfying task, like a hobby is good quality of time. Uh, or just feeling like, hey, I'm cool. You know, the, the way I'm spending my time is kind of a cool way to spend time. And then small wins. So progress brings happiness. And so if you're making progress in life, that's good quality of time. So maybe the best way to en enhance quality of time is to host an experience. And so can you host an experience for somebody that's enjoyable uh, and that they can spark off and take advantage of to improve their life? I think that's the best kind of quality of time that we can offer other people. Next slide. Now, Gary Chapman, who talks about the love languages, he's a psychologist, I'm pretty sure, who's interested in kind of relationship health. And he says one of the love languages or the way that people express love to each other is with quality time. And so quality time in a relationship is undivided focused attention and quality activities. And in quality activities, the emphasis is not on what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And quality conversations, valuing the other person, trying to sincerely understand uh, with depth and humor and interesting conversation and flow and and there's enjoyment for the people involved. And then also managing tough times is part of quality time. Next slide. What I would argue though, is don't let useless unpleasantness chew up the clock. And so we gotta figure out how we can enhance our quality of time uh, and in a healthy way rather than in an unproductive way. Next slide. So one approach to quality of life is contentment. And so Carl Menninger, who's a famous psychiatrist, he developed the Menninger Clinic. It's in Houston, Texas. It used to be in Topeka, Kansas. It's a famous psychiatric institute. He says mental health is the ability to adjust to the external world with contentment and master the task of acculturation. And so contentment becomes so important to mental health. And Muhammad, the famous spiritual leader, says patience is the key to contentment. And so it's this feeling I'm enough or I enjoy enough and life is full of small satisfactions and savoring helps to bring contentment. So you savor past events with photos that anchor the experience or maybe savor something in the future that you look forward to. And so contentment is an attitude of the heart rather than something someone struggles to reach. And uh, in spiritual practice, people get like a spiritual joy where they kind of surrender into uh, a, a bliss or contentment or serenity. And so people who are spiritual people often feel content in whatever the way life is, you know, so there, there can be a uh, quality of life, no matter what the circumstances with a spiritual joy. Next slide. Now, when you think about progress as an approach to quality of life, I think of the, the philosophy of meliorism. And what meliorism says is that life can be improved. And so there's two kinds of meliorism. You've got mitigative meliorism and constructive meliorism. And so mitigative meliorism means that we're going to solve problems to improve life, whereas constructive meliorism is about building something positive. And so you can improve life both mitigatively and constructively. Next slide. And then when we approach patients, I think of the situation a patient faces like a traffic light. And so if someone's in the red zone, you know, they're in crisis mode and you got to, if this person needs hospitalization for uh, detox or psychiatric problem like suicidality or homicidality, or they can't care for themselves, and so in the red zone, the person is in crisis and you need a solution quickly. The yellow zone is where things are just a little off and so adjustments need to be made. And then the green zone is where architecting and building a flourishing quality of life become most important. And so when patients are doing better, you don't want to just say, okay, great, I'll see you, you know, in a month. I'm glad you're doing better. You want to say, hey, you know, what can we do to enhance your quality of life? You know, to get you to a place where you're really kind of satisfied with things and not just looking at your health related quality of life. Next slide. So one thing about this is you don't focus on sci fi goals and miss out on opportunities that create real value right now. 
And so if some people have unrealistic expectations about what their quality of life should be, and maybe they're possible, but it's not something that you can really implement right away to have an impact on quality of life. Next slide. And then Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post says, life is a dance between making it happen and letting it happen. And so you're not going to be able to just force your way into a good quality of life. There's a balance here where you make effort and then you allow things to de develop. Next slide. And then I've given talks before about identity. I think that's so important in health and quality of life. And with your identity, you, you enact your identity or who you think of yourself as, who you are. And so you don't want to settle for a stuttled identity. That's why I work with that with patients. You know, if they are talking about drug screens and saying, you know, they've been clean or dirty, you know, I think that kind of language is stunting their identity. It's so much better to say I'm sober or not sober. And so I, I help them to kind of shape the way they view themselves by the language they use about themselves. And so you want to create a strong and distinctive sense of self. And then your actions and likes and dislikes prove your identity. And in, in the addictions recovery, patients really make a radical shift in their identity. And I think that enhances their quality of life. Next slide. All right. So if we're going to approach improving quality of life, we need a theory. So as it says here, like a sailor without a compass, any individual who sets out to navigate their way to a flourishing quality of life through the dark waters of the mind without a theory will soon be lost at sea. Next slide. So reality therapy is a therapy that was developed by William Glasser in the 1960s. And he didn't talk about quality of life exactly, but that was really what he was addressing. And he's, he said reality therapy focuses on realism and responsibility. It's not really about mental disorders. And it focuses on here and now problem solving and trying to choose a better future. It does not concern oneself with the patient's past. So you're not focused on the past, you're focused on intervening in the current quality of life and improving things. And, and control is the key issue in reality therapy. And so how do you get control? You get control by evaluating current behavior and planning possible behavior. Next slide. And so as an outgrowth of reality therapy and kind of my research about what's being done across the country in addictions counseling, I found an empowerment counseling and uh, I kind of developed my own model of this because there's not a literature about empowerment counseling. But the basic premise here is that the stronger you are, the easier life is. And so with empowerment counseling, it's about people believing in themselves through strengthening. And so the way you do that is by building up historical and contextual resources. So of course they feel empowered. And when they feel empowered, it's visceral, and they feel supported by their resources, and then they can take control of their life when they feel empowered. Next slide. All right, so how do you, what are these historical and contextual resources? Well, here's some examples. So for historical resources, small wins, you know, little accomplishments in life throughout the history of a person's life. It could be something as simple as you know, learning to walk. You know, that was a, a win that most people accomplish in their life. That's empowering. You know, that person struggled through as a toddler. And there's so many small wins throughout life that empower us and, and the patients in general. And then any contribution or significance the patient has or skills, or what do they offer their contacts or connections at work and personal life? You know, do they help other people win? Or uh, do they, does the sun shine on the person that they're with, you know, that they, they make them feel good about themselves? And then even being humbled by the confidence other people place in them or competitiveness brings out empowerment. And then anything the person did to correct an insecurity or reassure themselves uh, can be empowered, empowering. And then success uh, equals momentum. So if they they have successes, they get a momentum going, and that's part of the historical resources. And then contextual resources are things like posture and body language. Uh, the clothes that somebody wears can be empowering if they feel good in the in what they're wearing. Uh, if their language gets elevated, so they speak with more formal language or more beautiful language, 
you know, when you develop your language, you know, like I'm working on using metaphors in my language now. I like to hint at things sometimes to get a point across. You know, I think it, it kind of surpasses defenses if you can hint at something. And so I, I, I'm always trying to advance my language. And I, it's kind of like going from white milk to chocolate milk. You can't go backward and be less uh, accomplished at your language. You're always kind of developing your language. And, and it's, a, it's an empowering resource. And then learning by observation and association. So what is the context socially of your environment? And you, know, you can nestle yourself carefully into the ecology of your social environment and settle into resonance with them. And so the kind of social group that you associate with can be a contextual resource. And you can choose your social group. You know, even if you're not maybe having a large group of friends that you, you associate with, maybe you can investigate the lives of people on the internet or watch movies of people that are a different kind of social group than what you're used to. And then being widely traveled or internationally educated or cosmopolitan in taste and influences. So that kind of is a, an empowering resource to have lots of influences outside of your location. And then having someone confident to impress. So if you if there's a person in your life who you want to impress, that's a contextual resource that's empowering. And we know a lot about zip code and the impact of zip code on uh, health outcomes. And so zip code can be empowering. It can also be disempowering. And so you want to think about, you know, what is my living environment and how empowering is that for me? And then groups have more resources than individuals. So you're getting a sense of what these historical and contextual resources are. Next slide. And then also the therapeutic alliance can be empowering and empowerment counseling. And so if you believe in the patient, it creates what's called a Pygmalion effect where your expectancies change and your expectancy kind of affects how your outcome. And so believing in the patient, you know, they see it in the look in your eye that has a powerful impact on the patient. And then sending the right signal. So your body language and tone of voice and how you interact with the patient, you know, all that can be empowering or disempowering. And so you, you wanna be aware of you know, what are my signals in this patient. And then undermining the myths in dark psychology, you know, for example, just as an example of a myth that's so ridiculous in society, you know, women have come a long way in society, and it used to be kind of thought of as women who were leaders or physicians, or you know, that that was an unrealistic expectation for a woman. That's totally ridiculous. You know, we need to undermine those kind of myths that uh, that uh, allow abuses of power and and help people be empowered by kind of sensible thinking about what's what's reasonable. And then love heals. So if you can love the patient where they're most ruined in their life and empower them that way, be supportive and caring to them. And then instill hope. You know, I, I, I instill hope with kind of a stubborn creativity. I have a stubborn hope. And so that, that helps to empower the patient and model assertiveness. So you can shape the growth of, of assertiveness in the patient and then even share your power. You know, you can share your ego so if a patient is feeling hopeless, you say, you can you can borrow my hope. You know, I'm stubborn. So just uh, you can borrow what I've got. Next slide. And then I think even inspiring a dose of rebellion can be empowering. You know, patients get into substance use problems partly for rebelling against mainstream society. And they can rebel their way right out of substance use in that culture. Uh, you know, kind of having a, a little bit of a naughty kid and childlike spirit can help uh, dis destroy and stifle the atmosphere that's holding them back. So you can kind of be rebellious and appealing instead of rebellious and destructive. And then you want to acknowledge contribution and foster aut autonomy. You know, when patients make their own decisions, it, there's like an organic X factor when they're living their lives based on their own choices and leading a self-directed think for yourself kind of life. Uh, you know, I think that they accomplish the most that way and that's very empowering. And then you want to challenge them with stretch projects, uh, you know, push them to evolve. And lastly, in the therapeutic alliance, you can unlock talent. And so you want to kind of have the right stance in your relationship with the patient to help them excel. 
And to me, that means supporting them, but also challenging them and having a little bit of an inspiring intensity. And you can even unlock talent with your own style of poetry. You know, just the way that you shape things for patients can be empowering to them and help unlock talent. Next slide. All right, so what about mitigating problems and constructing a flourishing life? So problem solving, basically it's about what are the pain points? And I think you can look at the pain points uh, in core quality of life. So love, work, health, and place and quality of time. And it's critically important to use healthy problem solving in the face of difficulties rather than avoidance-based coping. So when patients are avoiding addressing their problems, they just kind of grow and get out of control. And, and so you got to kind of tackle these things. Sometimes if it's a really frustrating kind of a, of a problem that you can't make progress with, you can step back and build delay tolerance. But then you got to identify problems and then work toward improving them. And so uh, tension is the key signal that there's a problem. And so if the patient is expressing some kind of attention or you sense a, a tension in what they're talking about, that's a problem there. And you can, you can feel the tension where the problems lie. Next slide. And so what is the know-how that you need to solve problems? We know a lot about solving problems. There's published solutions and good advice from people with experience and adaptations from similar problems or from different domains uh, that have things that can be compared and, and utilized. And you want to filter the signal from the noise. You know, there's so much going on in life and you got to kind of narrow it down to what are the key elements of this situation and then kind of delimit the chaos and, and kind of an apocalyptic spread that can happen with a problem as it gets out of control. And so you want to have pattern recognition and then apply the mental mapper principle to this pattern that you've identified. And you and if you're having trouble with that, describe the problem in as many different ways as you can to see it, see it with fresh eyes. So you kind of see old problems from a new angle. So you know maybe looking at quality of life is a new angle to look at substance use disorders. And you know is this a is this a different way to look at this? And you know maybe maybe we'll find some solutions here. And then also root cause is not always necessary to find. So what maintains the problem? What's happening here and now that maintains this problem? You don't necessarily have to know what the underlying root cause is. And then you can fix the process. When you know what maintains it, you can fix the process and then you solve the problem or you can build something to solve it. Next slide. All right, so when it comes to constructing good quality of life, it, it boils down to design. And Nuri Oxman, who's uh, at MIT in the Media Lab, uh, she says, we must design where we are going from here. And so how can we best design change? And so you want to broaden and build these core quality of life areas and kind of start with an idea of beauty. And then when your dreams get realized and settled, that can be so satisfying to a patient to realize their dreams. And you have to be fearless, you know, and up for the design fight and design to find the ambitions of the project and get to know the terrain of what you're working with and then kind of fuse logic with imagination. So you, you want to have some dreams and imagine and kind of a better life, but it has to be logical and sensible, the, the approach to it. And you make a way. And then you, you decide a future course of action from the alternatives uh, and uh, design with love. So you know, people in the design field say that having a, a passion and a love for what you're designing brings out the best designs. And then lastly, design with a strong point of view and be bold. So that's what, that's what I recommend. And, you, uh, and in general, we don't think of designing things in patients' lives too much. You know, it's mostly about mitigating problems. So I think there's a whole kind of field to look at in substance use treatment about how do we design better lives for these patients and not just, uh, not just mitigate problems. Next slide. So Carol Kaufman, who's an executive coach from Harvard, says if there is a disconnect between who you are and who you want to be, it may point to a different set of internal priorities you need to meet before tackling the one you're going after and missing on. 
And so sometimes patients get stuck and they can't figure out why they can't improve something, but maybe there's some other issue that they're not addressing that's distracting them uh, from moving forward with what they really want to do. Next slide. And then there's also something called parallel recoveries. And so if you're mitigating problems and constructing a flourishing life and intervening in these different areas to improve health and, and functioning, you can impact different aspects of life in parallel. And so some things are good for both mental illness and addictions or good for both pain and addictions or physical healing and addictions or troubled relationships and addictions or work issues and addictions. Uh, good for their place and addictions. And also you can have things that impact the individuals, the families and the communities in parallel. And so the community and the whole ecological niche are really our clients. And so these parallel recoveries are about what I'm talking about here to improve quality of life. So not just focusing on medical health. Next slide. So Abraham Verghese is one of my favorite authors. He writes medical novels and uh, he's over at Stanford. Uh, in this novel, Cutting for Stone, he, one of the major points in it is to make something beautiful of your life. And so I think if you make something beautiful of your life, you have good quality of life. And so uh, you know, if patients can find a way to have that kind of purpose and meaning to their life, you know, I think it gives a good quality to it. Next slide. And then the idea here is to launch it a little bit ugly and then build it under the public gaze. So you don't have to have the solution immediately to your quality of life. It's really progress that you want. You're slowly moving toward what you're hoping for and progress brings happiness. So it's not necessarily having the solution to this whole thing, but maybe just making progress piece by piece uh, to move toward what you're hoping for. Next slide. And then the Dalai Lama says, people take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. And just because they're not on your road doesn't mean they've gotten lost. And so sometimes we think, you know, our way is the only way and patients should improve the way I think they should improve. You kind of got to be open-minded about, you know, what is their kind of path they're finding to improve and how can I help them kind of avert the 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 problems along the way that's going to interfere with what they're hoping for. You know, what are their aims and how can I help them get there? Next slide. And along these lines, so failure is a rehearsal for success. So some patients get so demoralized by failure. And I, you know, to me, failure is chipping away. You're getting closer and closer and closer to what you're hoping for. And so uh, I, I don't object to failure at all. You know, it's the path to success. And so just think of it as a rehearsal. Next slide. So these are pictures of me. You can see that I've changed in my life over to, since my son was born uh, to my life now. And so to me, it's a driving force to not just build great love, work, health, and place and quality of time, but actually to create a lifestyle around these things. And so people change, right? Next slide. When life becomes amazing and you just love it, you know that you're being fulfilled, that your body has truly lived. So that, that's kind of what we're hoping for, for patients and ourselves. Next slide. And now I'm interested in positive psychology and positive psychiatry. And quality of life is closely tied to this idea of positive psychology. So positive psychology is about flourishing. And really flour a flourishing life is really a quality of life. And it's about positive emotions and character strength and virtues and living a life worthwhile. And so I think focusing on the positive sheds light on what makes a life worth living. And so uh, this is not a talk about positive psychology per se, but there's a whole field out there kind of looking at how do we build a flourishing life and maybe not just mitigate problems. Next slide. All right, so case examples. Here's a couple in recovery. So a late 20 year old female split up with her physically abusive boyfriend. Uh, she went to the women's shelter and got involved in treatment for opioid and cocaine uh, use disorder. She has a daughter in elementary school. The daughter's father is still actively using substances. Daughter lives with patient in the shelter. 
She connected with a male friend in his mid thirties and NA who had a year of sobriety from opioids and started his own construction business. They started going to NA and AA meetings together. She got a job at a restaurant and gradually rose up the promotion ladder until she became a, the regional manager. The couple married, he sponsors others in early recovery after achieving four years of sobriety. They are active in the recovery community, chair mutual support group meetings, and host activities for those in recovery with them. They enjoy a good quality of life together, sober and strong. So let's think about core quality of life in these patients. So obviously there were, there were issues with core quality of life in the beginning for this female with an abusive boyfriend and you know, in the throes of addiction with opioids and cocaine and life is kind of unraveled. And then she developed kind of a loving relationship and she's successful in her work. So her work is meaningful and they host uh, activities in NA and AA and recovery that are fun for them. So they have good quality of time. Uh, they're, they're living together, making money. So they have a, a healthy place to live. So you can see that their quality of life has been impacted uh, in this recovery process. Any questions about that? All right, next slide, please. If you skip one. All right, so what are the conclusions? So quality of life is an important goal in treating conditions that cannot be cured. And so we, we have this condition, it's a chronic condition, addictions or chronic uh, illnesses, and uh, you're not gonna cure it, but you can impact uh, not only days of abstinence, but quality of life. And to me, quality of life seems more important to patients than it does to providers. And so we really need to think about how can we impact this and what should we focus on and you know, where can we put our energy in the patient's life to improve this important area. And so to me, the, the key thing here is this core quality of life, which is a term that I'm coining here. And so love, work, health in place and quality of time. You know, that's what that's where the rubber meets the road. And so you want to mitigate problems and design and build a quality of life. And I think reality therapy and empowerment counseling are key ways to help patients get control of their lives and impact this quality of life. And don't forget about parallel recoveries. So we're not just focused on addictions recovery, but all these domains of life can recover in parallel. And then maybe they can make something beautiful of their life and craft a future. And uh, to me, the art of quality of life is where true sober fulfillment lies. All right, next slide is my references. So what do you guys think? Is quality of life a neglected area of substance use treatment? Should we be measuring that and focusing on it in our patients' lives? Does quality of life uh, prevent relapse? You know, if somebody has a good quality of life, is that going to help uh, reduce the likelihood of relapse? What do you guys think? Please feel free to unmute, chat in. I do see individuals saying absolutely like Sarah and Richard Diamond saying, I love this. And, you know, just to give you more time to think upon what you want to say, I thank you again so much, Dr. Herschel. This is a very inspiring talk. I'm kind of surprised there isn't more on empowering counseling. And I think this is an area that's not just neglected, probably in SUD, but in many other areas of medical uh, practices. Great. I, I was curious how these ideas do or don't fit in with kind of traditional 12-step sort of recovery uh, programs and that sort of thing? Well, so in my opinion, the 12-step approach is kind of a spiritual approach to recovery, uh, where you do an examination of your life and you know, kind of a moral inventory and then work toward a spiritual recovery uh, and maybe fostering more of a contentment in life than uh, focusing on progress and building something. It's a little different focus. I think it's useful and it does work, but some patients don't do so well. So uh, I wonder, it's kind of a different spin. What do you think, other, other people who are more deeply involved in 12 step, what do you think? 
What do you think, PJ? Well, a 12 step for me is <clears throat> the way that I utilize it in my life is more of a, um, a holistic approach. Um, you know, not just addressing the, the spiritual side of, of what ails me, so to speak, but, you know, addressing, um, my failure to take care of my health, uh, both physically and mentally. And, uh, I, I approach it with a little more holistic view, uh, you know, but some people, um, in 12 step recovery do kind of prioritize the spiritual side of it, uh, which is something that, that I've tried to, to balance out in, in that, you know, to try to keep some type of, uh, balance in, in that holistic scheme of things. <clears throat> and it seems to work really well for me. Um, you know, because it's, it's, uh, I don't, the, uh, the counting days and things like that, that that's not really the focus. You know, the focus is the uh, quality of life that, that Dr. Herschler was talking about for me. What do you think of core quality of life? Do you think that's where the rubber meets the road, the other elements? Uh, absolutely. I mean, for me, it, it definitely does. <clears throat> you know, because my quality of life, um, previously was, was pretty poor, you know, uh, being in and in and out of institutions and, and struggling with substance abuse, you know, that wasn't a very good quality of life. And, and today that, that, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get to put that sort of a lot of your theories to the test on a daily basis. What do you think, PJ, what do you think of quality of time? So do you think people are seeking substances to address their quality of time, how well their time is spent? I think that could definitely be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because people get frustrated with, well, I, I did this, but it wasn't as fulfilling as I wanted it to be. So they, they rely on that substance or various substances to to fulfill that need to to get that fulfillment that they're missing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think uh, I think all of this is is super interesting, and I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you, PJ. Thank you, PJ. Thank you for sharing sharing all of that with us. Um, another comment, I think Earl Nightingale's philosophy, Strangest Secret, comes to mind about writing goals and staying focused on self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So if you meet your needs, eventually you reach a state of growth where you're self-actualizing, you know, reaching your potential. Any other comments or, yeah, Joel, go ahead. One, one last thing, because because a part of what you mentioned and, and didn't talk a lot about was kind of service to others in terms of kind of finding meaning and, and getting outside yourself and, and serving others. If you could comment on that. Yeah, so sometimes the best thing you can do to help yourself is to help someone else. And, I, and it does, I, I was talking about historical resources for empowerment. And so when, when you have an experience like that, where you're a positive influence on someone else, it's, it, it, you get a sense of empowerment from it. it it's a, it gives you a transcendent feeling to be useful for someone else. And so yeah, I definitely believe helping others is an empowering thing and, and helps improve quality of life. And that is a certainly part of 12 step recovery, you know, 12, the 12 step uh, in terms of carrying the message is, is really about being of service to others. Thank you. Any other stories or times you guys want to share with any patients of empowering stories? So, um, Dr. Hirschler, this is Jennifer Boyd, and I'm, I've been driving, but I've been able to listen, and um, this was just really a wonderful 
talk. I really appreciate it. And it, it um, brings to mind a couple of things for me. One is things that I've learned from my predecessors in our program. I work in our, um, in our weekly group with people who have fewer than 90 days of sobriety. And, and there are many, I've said this before, there are many people in that group who really have um, been in that group for a long time and struggle because of relapse to um, move forward. And yet I've learned from my predecessors in the program that um, you know, to look at the other aspects of their life that they are feeling successful about. So getting a job or getting time with their children or um, just small steps and to reinforce that. And and sometimes in group and so, sometimes, or, or even just um, if they're able to make meetings, you know, make the meeting requirements. And so I see that that, um, it's, it's slightly, it's part of quality of life. I mean, of course, the key thing is to ask them how, what they would see as their quality of life and, and how to achieve that. But just, you know, giving positive reinforcement for, um, for goals independent of relapse um, has seemed to me to be um, a, a positive way to approach approach people, even if they continue to struggle with relapse. So I just wonder what you think about that. Yeah, so that speaks to the small wins I was talking about in your historical resources for empowerment. So it's empowering to feel like I've had some accomplishments and moving in the right direction. And then also it gets to the, met the idea of parallel recoveries. So if someone got a job and they're functioning better at work, maybe they're slipping in substance use still, but there's a parallel recovery process going on where what's good for work is going to, you know, they, if they're in the throes of addiction, that's not going to work with their work life and they're enjoying being more successful and having more money. So there's going to be a parallel recovery process there. Do you follow me? Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. Yeah. And, um, and I'm thinking that it might be useful just in group to ask people about their ideas for their quality of life. What what are things that they imagine for themselves? I've tried asking what would they what would sobriety what would it look like for them if they were sober? But maybe just asking them about quality of life and having them reflect on that um, to get them thinking about that. Yeah, what I often ask is, what does success look like for you? Nice. Yeah. yeah. And then I'd always be interested in what, is it, what do you think a successful life would be for you? One other short comment I'll make is we have one gentleman who um, is really struggling and struggled due to meth. And he, he stayed free from opioid use for, you know, three or four years now, but, but uses meth regularly. And um, we have, we at, at times have had him assisting our peer um, recovery support specialist who also does maintenance in our organization, and we've made it contingent upon um, a week of sobriety, a week of, ne of negative drug screen. And so he hasn't, and he really likes work. This guy really likes working, and and being around the PRSS is helpful for him. Well, he hasn't been able to have a negative drug screen for a really long time. So recently, as a team, we decided, well, as long as he's not acutely intoxicated let's just ask him to work and see if um, working, which is which he likes, is useful for him, leads to the sobriety, as opposed to if sobriety leads to work. And um, so we're sort of seeing how that goes. Yeah, so I think work is good for your ego. You know, when you're being productive and, you know, helping people accomplish things, it, it feels good to your ego. And so maybe that ego strength will help him rein in kind of what's happening with the substance use. And I'd be really interested in what his quality of life is, you know, like what, what's his quality of time and what's what's happening in those four areas, you know, love, work, health, and place. And are they terribly dissatisfying and he's trying to palliate his emotions, you know, with methamphetamine. I, I wonder if that's part of what's happening with him. Yeah, yeah, that will be interesting to explore with him. Thank you so much for the Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, there's another chat. Can you comment on reconciling empowerment in the context of the first step and admission of powerlessness over the substance of addictive 
focus? Yeah, so what I talk to patients about surrendering. I don't talk about powerlessness, but I talk about surrendering. And to me, surrendering is saying, you know, that life does not work for me. I've tried substances. It does not work for me. I've just got to surrender to this idea that it's just not this kind of a healthy decision on my part to, to realize this just does not work. And so it, it's a surrendering process, which it, I think that's what they mean when they say powerless, but powerless is such a strong word. And I want them to feel powerful in other ways of their life. But this is just not an option for them biologically. And I think they have to surrender there. Does that Thank help? You. you can um, unmute too and, and discuss that further if you'd like, Matthew. I think it's good though. I'm not hearing it. <laughs> but yeah, play on words, kind of like you mentioned, you know, saying dirty versus sober, not sober, I think. Words really do matter. So thank you. And great question. Does anybody else have any comments or questions before we close for the evening? Yeah, I'd just like to say that I, I really was inspired by the lecture and that the uh, I think when we look at recovery capital, a lot of times, you know, we're evaluating the patient's quality of life when we're doing recovery capital. And I like what he said about the tension, you know, that it's a good way to pick up that a patient's struggling in the in the rooms. And I, I really like what he said about Dalai Lama, that quote about, you know, just sometimes we try to put people in what we think is their recovery when they get to sort of decide for themselves what recovery means to them. So very, very nice lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garvey. And I would just say the part about surrender, I would also say we do have to surrender our egos. Those of us in addiction, we have to surrender some of that ego. All right, anyone else? Thank you very much. Getting more chats in, excellent. Really appreciate everyone joining and comments, questions, and just hearing this lecture out. All right. If there aren't any other questions or comments, the only announcement I have is the next time we'll meet, Dr. Hersher will speak again, but this time on how to address cases of complex addiction. So we look forward to that, and I hope you guys have the great rest of your August. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.